Good morning, everyone. Welcome. You can tell this is our first show because we're experiencing technical difficulties as we get started, but I would like to welcome you to the CSBG Service Center. My name is Steve St. John, IHCDA Community Programs Manager for Monitoring, and I will be hosting this new educational series called The Car Mechanic. It's uh, similar to a TED Talk, but for CSBG monitoring. Each show will cover different topics or themes. We will also utilize different ways to share the information from the familiar presentation format or interview method, which is common on talk shows. Uh, we may even do some quizzes, interactive challenges, fun facts along the way. What we hope, though, is at the end of the day, you leave with a better understanding of what we discussed and you gain a different perspective on the topic. Today's topic centers around, centers around capacity building, but it also includes a very special guest, community actions well-renowned and well-traveled Mr. Charles McCann, CCAP Emeritus. But before we get into our interview, I just wanna briefly go over the monitoring mission statement. At IHCDA, the Division of Community Programs Monitoring strives to provide a fair and consistent, comprehensive risk-based evaluation of operational and fiscal performance with an eye towards facilitating continuous improvement and capacity building of our network. So with that said, it is with great excitement that I get to introduce our very first guest speaker, Charles McCann. Hi, Charles. Hi, Steve. How are you today? I am doing fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Hey, for those who have not had the opportunity to be your student, can you please provide just kind of a brief, a brief background or history about yourself? Sure. And Steve, first, I want to thank you so much for asking me to be here. Uh, it's my honor to be the uh, uh, the guest on what season one, episode one, I guess we could say. Yes. Uh, uh, it is an honor, and I appreciate you asking very much. Uh, it's always kind of embarrassing talking about yourself, but uh, let's suffice it to say that I heard President Kennedy's call to service when I was in high school. Uh, when I graduated college in 1967, I started working with a community action agency. I was there for oh several years, and I worked in neighborhood youth corps. Head Start and weatherization programs. In 1975, I went to the state office and was Missouri's first weatherization director. And I was at the state office during the transition from the Federal Community Services Administration, administration of the uh, programs, to the block grant. So when the Community Services block grant came in 19. Uh, 81, I was there at the state office, and it catapulted our office to a position of power and influence so far as community action was concerned. I retired from the state in 2000, but that is an accurate statement. I retired from the state, but not from community action, and uh, I remained active as a national professional certification commissioner, CCAP, uh, Steve, I see you're wearing your shirt, proclaiming that you're a CCAP. Steve is a CCAP, a certified community action professional. And the classes Steve was talking about, uh, you know, the students, is that I, for many years, have taught classes around the country to people seeking to become certified community action professionals. Uh, I've been able to travel all around the country until the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic changed the mode of operation, but it didn't change uh, what I was doing, except instead of traveling around uh, literally, I had to travel around virtually. So that's enough about me. Let's uh, uh, let's go on and talk, and talk about something that's really important. All right. Well, today's topic is capacity building, and I want to be able to dive into your years of experience and so you how you can connect capacity building with how community action is today. So first, how long, in your opinion, has the concept 
of capacity building, continuous improvement, been around community action? Steve, it's been around since the very first day. Uh, community action started uh, with groups of people uh, from all different walks of life, uh, all different demographics coming together because they were united by a common thread. And that thread was they thought poverty was wrong and they were going to do something about that. And they were going to do it through community action. And uh, with the with the initial premise that community action would mobilize the entire community uh, to fight poverty. But how to do that? How do you do that? How do you build the capacity to do that? And in the, uh, the earliest days, there were CAP guides, both CAP guides in uh, community action concepts and CAP guides in community action administration. So if you were uh, hesitant or unsure about how you know, books should be kept, well, there was a CAP guide on how to keep books in a community action agency. Uh, if you're kind of unsure what the theory of the philosophy was, there were CAP guides on the philosophy of community action. The, uh, in the later 60s, in my region, the regional office uh, engaged the University of Missouri through the University of Missouri Multipurpose Training Center. And in the late 60s, we were sent to various trainings uh, on what then were best practices to expand capacity. In the 70s, in the CSA years, CSA main focus was on good management and they provided training on, you know, capacity building. Uh, later in the, in the 80s, uh, in the 80s, in Missouri, I'm from Missouri, so Missouri is what I know most about. Uh, we at the state office, we gave the CAP agencies a list of questions about how they would implement the four functions of management, planning, organizing, directing, and evaluating. Then we took their answers to uh, what is now Truman State University and met with the professors there and asked them if they would develop a curriculum to help agencies answer these questions better. And that became the Executive Development Institute. So again, that was more capacity building. Uh, in the 90s, you had uh, CCAP, Certified Community Action Professional, where you had a, a knowledge base of those knowledge sets and skill sets that uh, it was thought one must know and be able to practice well in order to do community action work well. That's more capacity building. Later in the 90s, you had the uh, standards of excellence, uh, capacity building. And then in, in this century, uh, the organizational standards. So again, you know, capacity building. So capacity building has been around community action since the first day. There's always been that kind of that mindset that if you don't, if you don't do that continuous improvement, what you're saying to the poor is, it's good enough for who it's for. And we don't think that's right. So from the very first day, you start with where you are, but then demand that continuous improvement. And you do that through capacity building. I, I wanna to touch on the standards of excellence in a minute, but before we get to that point, can you talk specifically, because you've went through each kind of decade on how continuous improvement was has been infused in community action. Mm -hmm. But the very beginning from our standpoint was the CSBG Act. Mm -hmm. So can you enlighten us a little bit on, on how the CSBG Act is kind of a catalyst for capacity building? How it started mm -hmm. all of that? Sure. The, the CSBG Act is really a marvelous 
piece of legislation. And uh, just, I know it's not a show and tell, but just kind of for a show and tell, I brought my copy of the CSBG. <laughs> I see it's all marked up. I've actually, re I've actually read this <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe even studied it. It's a marvelous piece of legislation. It really, it really, really is. Uh, and people will say, well, that replaced the old OEO and CSA. And I suppose it's how you look at it, but it really didn't replace it. It, I think it more recast it. And because the various concepts explicated in the Economic Opportunity Act, which was rescinded by the CSBG Act, those concepts are present in the CSBG Act. Uh, you know, it's there. It's all there, but it's been it's been recast. Uh, so uh, it was kind of left to us to, to dig it out, but but it was there. So if you analyze the CSBG Act, uh, in that act is the mission, the mission we've always had to remove obstacles and solve problems which block the achievement of self sufficiency. That's statutory. The goal. The CSBG Act demands three things. First, a reduction of poverty, and you're going to do it in two ways, a revitalization of communities and empowerment of people. And you have to have both. You have to have both. There's the old saying that if you give a person a fish, they'll eat today. But if you teach them to fish, they'll eat for a lifetime. And every time I hear that said, I don't add as quickly as possible, but not if somebody drains the pond or poisons it or pollutes it or doesn't stock it or redlines the dock. So you can only fish away from the good, where the good fishing spots are. So you need both. Uh, when people when people lack the skills they need to compete, then you can do fishing, that empowerment of people. But if the problem is centered in the community, the factory closed, there's discrimination of one group or another. There are you know, community issues. That's pond maintenance. I mean, they're called community action agencies for a reason. So you need both. You need the fishing and you need the pond. And the law goes through that and states that you're going to achieve these things through a measurable and potentially major impact on the causes of poverty conditions. The law thoughtfully indicates what the six poverty conditions are. Uh, unemployment, inadequate education, uh, problems with available income, inadequate housing, unmet emergencies, including health, and malnutrition. So you've got the, the basis there for uh, what the poverty conditions are to work on. And if you think there's a poverty condition there that's not specifically listed, in Missouri what we did is we folded that under an unmet emergency, either an existing emergency or perhaps emergency prevention. Uh, the law is pretty vague and silent about the causes because the concept of community action is it's local people making local decisions about local issues. The causes of, of poverty in Southern Indiana may not be the same causes of poverty up by Gary or in, in Indianapolis and central or, you know, it's, it's all different. And the idea was locally, those causes are determined, whether they're, and if the causes are fishing problems, problems centered in people, you teach fishing, if the problem is centered in the community, you deal with that. The law also identifies nine broad strategies for dealing with the problem. Uh, three of these strategies are individual based. The target is individuals and families. Six of the strategies are community-based, meaning the target is the community. 
So what you have then is you kind of have a, the act provides a floor plan for the agency. And virtually every program that an agency operates is going to have uh, to deal with some impact on some identified cause of one of those conditions. And that's the way, that's the way it kind of works. So uh, then for the continuous improvement comes, it, using that floor plan, you can you know, analyze the agency. It can kind of keep you focused. If in your agency analysis uh, against the framework of the CSBG Act, you find that you're doing a good job of, a uh, very thorough job of implementing strategies targeted to individuals, but doing nothing targeting the community, then are you really saying that the causes of poverty are 100% centered in the person? Uh, might the community, might there be some community issues in play as well? So you can begin to, to use that analysis to decide, you know, what improvements or what adjustments might be needed, or at least, or at least, you know, what you need to look at or uh, what you need to do to uh, either satisfy yourself that what you're doing is, is the right path, or maybe you need to change some. So I think the act is very helpful in that way. If you understand the, the framework provided and then assess the agency against that framework uh, can perhaps lead to some insight into, uh, you know, that, that king discernment, uh, the insight into what maybe needs to happen to move things along in a better way. So it, it kind sounds of a, like kind of a long answer to a, <laughs> to a short question. Well, but I mean, it, it, to, to kind of boil it down, though, it sounds like what you're saying is that the CSBG Act really kind of lays the foundation for community action itself. I think it does. I think it does. I think it lays the foundation for community action. So we also know that, I mean, with community action, there's a community action partnership and they developed standards of excellence. And they it, that kind of took that foundation and expanded on it. So how does the standards of excellence relate to capacity building? Well, uh, you know, the, the National Partnership, National Community Action Partnership website has some really good material on the standards of excellence. And uh, it identifies the standards of excellence as being based on the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award and specifically adapted for Community Action Network to define the very best practices for agencies. Then the first thing it says, Steve, is Pathways to Excellence is the, part, is the partnership's organizational capacity building initiative. There's that word, those words again, capacity building, using 35 standards spread among uh, seven categories. And those categories are organizational leadership. I've got them written down here. I don't want to leave any out. Uh, <laughs> organizational leadership, strategic planning and direction, consumer constituent and partnership focus, management analysis perform and performance management, human resource focus, organizational process management, and organizational results. You see, see, if you leave one out, you always leave the one out that's most important to somebody, and then they'll remind you of it, they'll remind <laughs> you of it later. Very true. Yeah. But the way it works, uh, if you get on this pathway to excellence, it's kind of voluntary, uh, but you don't want to say it's good enough for who it's for. It's kind of voluntary to, to go on this path and it's a process and in the process you get a a team of peer reviewers coming to your agency the reviewers have at least five years of management experience they provide you with a comprehensive feedback report that lays out a detailed improvement process 
and clear next steps for moving down the path. So in that way, the standards of excellence is the pathway. It is a pathway for that capacity building. Well, you know, a lot of those themes that you just talked about sound very familiar from yes. uh, there's a lot of those words you use that uh, sound like the organizational standards. So can you kind of share with me how the organizational standards relates to the standards of excellence? Uh, the organizational standards came later. The standards of excellence came first. Organizational standards later. Uh, the standards of excellence were driven a lot by us, by the partnership. The organizational standards, I think, were driven more by the federal uh, uh, Office of Community <laughs> Services and uh, under the leadership uh, at that time of the wonderful Jeannie Chaffin, who is also a CCAP. The, uh, I think perhaps the, the biggest difference between the standards of excellence and the organizational standards, the standards of excellence are voluntary. The organizational standards are required. So I think that would be a major, a major piece. Uh, and yes, the organizational standards, I think they both use the word standards. They both have standards. The organizational standards uh, uh, there's, you know, what, what do they call them? There, there are three, three thematic areas, maximum feasible participation, vision and direction, and uh, uh, operations and accountability. And they each then have three standards under that. So the standards do, they kind of, they kind of overlap. And I think because they're required then, these standards might be seen as a, as a baseline. But again, this is from the National Partnerships website, uh, indicates that, uh, that the purpose of the organizational standards is to ensure that all agencies have appropriate organizational capacity. There's the word again in both critical financial and administrative areas, as well as areas of unique importance to the mission of Community Action Network. I think that there's overlap in the standards. I think that the organizational standards probably are heavier in that uh, those areas of unique uh, importance in the mission of Community Action. <coughs> and, and even though the organizational standards perhaps are a baseline, they're not intended to just to just stand pat. That the the national partnership has a number of different training devices, uh, uh, manuals. Uh, they do webinars, all sorts of things, and. Uh, Again, from their website, designed to equip agencies with the ability both to meet and to exceed the organizational standards. So again, the focus isn't on when well, you meet a baseline and then you're done. You meet the baseline and then you begin with your <laughs> with your incremental you know, improvement. So, right. uh, so I think they really work, you know, very handily. In my mind, uh, I see that as soon as an agency meets the baseline, then they uh, avail themselves of some of these training materials and different and different things, and get on the pathway uh, to begin to continue to grow. Well, and I, I think those are those are good suggestions as far as creating the baseline and then it's the place to start and then you want to grow from there. Yeah. I also do want to touch base though, because it's my understanding that I know we have organizational standards, those are the required. But my I was always taught that 
you know, the people sitting at the table were also community action professionals. They were CCAPs. They, they helped, they took that, I guess, the standards of excellence and they kind of infused them in some ways into the organizational standards. They had their thumbprint on helping design that document. Yeah. Well, I think that's right. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the Council of Excellence was convened of community action people who crafted the organizational standards. It was a multi-year process. Uh, and I was at the first meeting when the standards of excellence were discussed. And you know who was convened? CCAPs. <laughs> so, you know, they're, you know, it's, it's our people. It's, you know, we're there. We, had, we do have our thumbprint. We do have our thumbprint on it. I see CCAP, you see the, the standards of excellence. We've been talking here about the organizational standards and standards of excellence, uh, which are focused on agency. But my understanding is that an agency isn't even uh, meet the basic criteria to attempt to receive the award for excellence unless they uh, buy into the branding and have CCAPs. So, and that's the uh, CCAP would be the, uh, the individual excellence equivalent of uh, the, the award for excellence that's given to, uh, uh, and hadn't been very many people, very many agencies uh, receive the award for excellence, actually get to the end of the pathway where they're, they're recognized. And, but, it would be the uh, the individual equivalent is the CCAP because you aren't going to have agency capacity building without excellence in staff. And uh, CCAP seeks to develop that excellence in staff. Well, I would definitely take this moment as a shameless plug that if you do not have CCAPs within your agency on your staff, that personally I found it to be a very worthwhile, enlightening, and educational experience in going through that process. Uh, so for those of you listening, if you don't have it, please consider looking at that as an option because it does bring us a great amount of value to your agency and ultimately the decision process decision processes you will make after that. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I, I, I'm pleased to hear you say that, Steve. I'm glad you had a good experience going through the, the CCAP process. And uh, it's a it's a three-year process as well. Some complete earlier than the three years, but but it's a, it was designed to be a three-year three-year process. All these are multi-year are multi-year things. And my plug for CCAP, you know, would be that. My assumption is that everybody in community action cares about the poor. You wouldn't be in community action if you didn't care about the poor. My assumption also is that everybody works for an agency who must have an annual audit. And I'm sure that the letters after the name of the person who signs the audit would be CPA, a certified public accountant that if they weren't a certified public accountant, you probably wouldn't even have them in to do the audit. Yeah. Uh, and the people to whom you have to present the audit probably wouldn't accept it. It wasn't done by a CPA. Yeah. Certified. So what's that C in CPA that's certified? What does that convey? Well, it conveys the person has the skill necessary to do the job and do it well, that they're up to the task that they have demonstrated to their peers that, you know, that they're in, that they have that capacity that they're in. And uh, so eventually it comes to the question, don't you think the poor you say you care about deserve as much? Very true, very true. Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your day and talking to us about capacity building and connecting that to community action. 
And I know you you mentioned earlier that uh, you've been retired maybe for 20 years, but uh, <laughs> you're traveling the country and now basically electronically right now. Busier, busier now than I ever was. <laughs> yes, and I know that yeah. you have a training that you're going to be starting soon, so I will let you go. But Steve, I do appreciate your time. Steve, it's been a delight. I've enjoyed so much being here and visiting with you. And uh, I would uh, leave with this uh, uh, the suggestion to, to those that are watching. All you that are watching in Community Action, I want you to know that you are probably better than you think you are. And you're probably stronger than you think you are and you're needed and you belong. And I'm so glad you're doing this work and thank you so much for your service to Community Action. Steve, it's been a delight. I've enjoyed it very much. Uh, look, to, look forward to seeing everybody out on the road there somewhere. Absolutely, I can't wait till we get a chance to talk in person. Me too, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, So that, that was a, a great opportunity for me personally to have Charles as our first guest. Uh, he probably doesn't know this, but I've, I've told my coworkers when I grow up, I want to be like Charles. I think he's an amazing individual. He has a lot of insight and knowledge and experience. So that's kind of what my aspiration is. Of course, it looks like he's kind of froze on the screen, so maybe he'll just be with us forever now. Well, I guess you'll always have Charles' face to look at as we go through the rest of the presentation. Okay, well, at least she's got a good picture. So I'm going to kind of go on and let's uh, see what happens. I do want to kind of expand on some of the things that he's talked about, uh, use some other references, uh, things he's alluded to. Uh, it's interesting because we talked, we went back in history, kind of talked about capacity building, but from actually, this is from Wikipedia. The term capacity act, capacity building indexes a series of initiatives from the 1950s in which the active participation of local communities or community members in social and economic development was encouraged via national and subnational plans. Well, that's directly how we got to where we are. I mean, that kind of laid the foundation in the 50s because we know what happened in the 60s. Uh, we talked about the OEO instruction or the OEO and the instruction 6320-1 talks about the Economic Opportunity Act introduced maximum feasible participation, whereas the people affected were involved in the decision making process. That act gives the community action agencies a primary catalytic mission to make the entire community more responsive to the needs and interests of the poor by mobilizing resources and bringing about greater institutional sensitivity. A CAA's effectiveness, therefore, is measured not only by the services which are directly provided, but more importantly, by the improvements and changes it achieves, the community's attitudes and practices towards the poor and in the allocation of focusing public and private resources for anti-poverty purposes. So again, you see those improvements, those words improvements and change. I wanna talk a little bit about community action capacity building. So community action, and this, is, this comes from NASCAP. So we've, we've talked a little bit about the partnership. Now we'll talk about the other side, which is NASCAP. 
They say that community action leaders at the national, state, and local levels need to work together to ensure that an enhanced monitoring system becomes a valuable tool to increase the capacity of community action to help people and to change lives. Monitoring and community action agencies is a state responsibility, but strengthening the capacity of community action agencies must be a shared responsibility among all the members of the community action, net community action network for it to be truly effective. The overall health of a community action agency encompasses more than just the technical compliance with specific program mandates. In order for a community action agency to be truly healthy, it must be continually striving to find better ways to use programmatic resources to help people move out of poverty. So again, we kind of can still see themes. Well, I'm gonna take a break right now uh, so our break portion of this of this program is called Did You Know? And the Office of Community Services within HHS, working with the national partners, has positioned CSPG and community action as a model for national performance management using the organizational standards and Roma the next generation. So there you go. We just took a break and that was the Did You Know section. So we're going to move on now we've been talking about capacity building we've talked about it only in the framework of how it relates to community action capacity building community action but i want to talk a little just use some of these terms in a broader sense just so you kind of get a sense of where they come from or what others in the profession are talking about so we're going to go right back to wikipedia again where it says capacity building is the process by which individuals and organizations obtain, improve, and retain the skills, knowledge, tools, equipment, and other resources needed to do their jobs competently. It allows individuals and organizations to perform at a greater capacity, large scale, larger audience, larger impact. So that's what Wikipedia says capacity building is. And that's really what we're trying to strive for every day that we come to work. The National Council of Not-for-Profits, this is what they have to say about capacity building, that it's not just about the capacity of the not-for-profit today, it's about the not-for-profit's ability to deliver its mission effectively now, but in the future. Capacity building is an investment in the effectiveness and future sustainability of the not-for-profit. So by doing capacity building, not only is our focus on improving it so we can affect the lives of those we serve, but to make sure that we have the systems in place that the agency itself will be around and striving in the future. So capacity building's influence on the organizational standards. We talked about it a little bit. I wanna get kind of give you a little bit more specific information. So the organizational standards, were developed by the CSBG Organizational Standards Center, Center of Excellence. Uh, Charles alluded to that. Their authority, though, is community opportunity, accountability, training, and educational service services, Human Services Reauthorization Act of 1998, PL 105285, Section 674B2A. Well, that was a mouthful. But that tells you that organizational standards, that's their authority. That's how they came into being. And the core national standards were published in the document we call IM-138. So you can, I, we kind of use that terminology interchangeable. IM-138 is the organiza organizational standards or vice versa. But why did they create it? And according to my research, it was a response to threaten cuts in funding. So years ago, they saw that the possibility of being defunded or funding cut, and they implemented these organizational standards to elevate the community action network over everyone else in the country, to say, you're a model, you're a leader. And that was an attempt to reduce our funding cuts. So the purpose of this was to build long-term capacity for CAAs to serve low-income communities, 
increase accountability and results of the CSBG network, set and meet high standards for organizational operations. So that was the whole goal of capacity building related to the organizational standards as it came out of the big long PL 105285 language. According to cap law, the CSBG organizational standards are a comprehensive framework designed to ensure that all CAAs have the capacity to provide high quality services to low income individuals and communities. And this was described actually by cap law in the CSBG to Head Start crosswalk, crosswalk. So when they were trying to explain what organizational standards were to Head Start people, this is the language they use. So this next, what we're gonna do next is kind of a little quiz, a little exercise. So what you see in front of you is setting the bar. These are effective and efficient not-for-profit exercise. This is part one of the exercise. And you're gonna see here that Follinger uh, Foundation created the top 10 practices to capacity building. And what I have listed right here, are one through five, on the next slide we'll do uh, six through 10. But the exercise, and what I would like you to do is to pull out your CSBG car tool, your Indiana car tool, and I would like for you to go through and see how many standards you can link to these first five themes. So don't have to take a long time, take about three to five minutes and create this exercise and go through and see how many standards you can link to these titles. And so go ahead and turn off your, or pause this recording right now and everybody open up your book and I'll see you in a couple minutes. Hey, welcome back. I hope everybody took this opportunity to start this exercise. What I would like to do is, da dun da dun. I have went through and did the exercise myself. Now, what you're gonna find with this exercise is there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Some of my answers may be a little different than yours, and that's okay. What I wanted to try to demonstrate with this is that Follinger said he these are capacity, these are top 10 practice for, for top 10 practices for capacity building. And I wanted to be able to show you if you look at these the standards in the car tool, how many of these were actually doing. So like first one is ongoing board development. And you'll see different standards here. So example 4.1 is the mission statement. 4.6 is your, your risk assessment. 5.8 is actual board training. So some of them are actual literal, we have a standard that matches this. Others, uh, others of these are connected. Uh, strategically plan the strategic plan routinely used. Well, that's six one and six five. Six one is having the plan. Six five is reporting it to your governing board on a regular basis. Look at high board uh, member engagement. Look how many potential standards are connected to that one. Uh, five five deals with your quorum and fill in vacancies timely. Uh, five nine is receiving programmatic reports at all the board meetings. 511 is basically fully engaged, the board fully engaged in development, planning, implementation, and evaluation. A side note to that, that is actual language from the CSBG Act and IM1 or IM82. 83 and 84 deal with the audit. 8-7 is, you know, why do I have to do financial reports at every board meeting? 8-9 uh, is the board approving the organizational budget. So those are just some examples of how high board member engagement is important and how these standards are associated. Let's look at board recruitment and orientation. 5-5 uh, five, five again is filling vacancies timely. That's your board recruitment. And there's actually a standard 5-7 for doing a board orientation. Uh, number five is dashboards for financial planning. 14.1 uh, and 14 through 14.4 in this all deals with the financial process analysis. So go, go into your car tool, look those up, and you can see some specifics. 
And so we're going to do the same game. Here's six through 10. I want everybody to pause this recording for about three to five minutes. Go through your car tool, see what you can come up with, and I'll see you on the other side. Hey, welcome back. I hope everybody paused the recording, did the exercise part two of it, and let's go through some of the examples. So just like we did before, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights because I really want you guys to dig in deep on your own time and see these connections. But this lets you know, hey, we are building capacity through the standards that we have. You look at number six, program evaluation. Well, like standard 1.3 talks about customer satisfaction data. 2.1.1 uh, is analyzing your partnerships. 4.4 uh, is reporting to the governing board the success of your community action plan. So those are some examples. Let's look at uh, number seven, which is increased financial uh, stability. You got 13.3 through 13.5. Those are all your claims. Those are your getting your money that basically you've done all the work for this money. And it's like, this is the process I need to obtain it from ICDA, and by doing that, that helps the financial stability because obviously you can pay people, including staff with that. They greatly appreciate that. Let's look at number eight. That seems to be the biggest one, accreditation, legal and financial compliance. So there's a lot going on with this one. Some highlights would be 8.1, that's doing your audit. Charles uh, talked about a CPA, this is where the CPA would come in. 8.6 is the, the requirement to complete a 990. 8.13 is the federal records retention. So every agency should have a record retention policy. You can't throw certain things away too soon. 10.4 uh, talks about the employee payroll and doing that correctly. So there's a lot of federal kind of requirements in number eight but you can look at how many standards we have that are connected to that. Let's look at that number nine, leadership transition planning and staff development. So 4.5 is the succession plan. 7.3 is having employee job descriptions current and up to date. Uh, 7.6, evaluating our uh, employees, doing a performance evaluation. Uh, 7.11, which is providing non-discrimination training. So those are ways that we do leadership transition planning and staff development. And finally, there's 10, the board CEO teamwork. Uh, the highlight here is 7.4 and 7.5, because that's the governing board actually evaluating the executive director and determining their compensation. Another example is 16.1. It's one of our bonus questions in the monitoring, but it is the governing board doing a self-evaluation, just like we encourage all agencies to evaluate all their programs, you know, the Roma philosophy, the board should be develop, uh, analyzing themselves as well. So they are continually getting better. So this provides you just a little example of how we are building capacity into monitoring. So I want to move on. I want to talk about some what we call the peak engine performance section. It's your best practices. And so, some tips on the topic. So things to think about. First, create an organizational culture that comes from your mission, vision, vision and values. Engage your stakeholders. Commit to the long term. Embrace technology and I we all have just went through a pandemic and we know the importance of technology. We know how it allowed us to operate. In tough times. And we had to learn that. So now that we've got to on the other side of it, let's embrace it. Let's go all in because that's gonna help us serve in the future. That's obviously where we're going, so, so embrace it. And then lastly, continually develop staff and volunteers at all levels. Build your base, create a strong foundation. 
you don't know who the next leader in a department, who's the next supervisor, who's the next manager, who's the next director, who's the next executive director. They may come from within your own ranks if you spend the time and effort in developing their skills. And at the very least, if they don't move up, you've built the capacity so they can at least work with and truly affect low income individuals that they serve. Some common obstacles that I want you to be aware of when it comes to capacity building. The first one is apathy. Viewing capacity building not as what we call real work and therefore it sees a low priority. If you're always striving to be the best, your bar is always going to be raised and you're, all, you're naturally going to serve your customers better by doing so and your community. The second obstacle to be aware of, staff leaders have short term or an operational mindset, so they're focusing on today's problems. And we always want to have the long game in mind. Everything we do is the long game. How does it affect the future? Now, predominantly that is a governing board responsibility, the long view. But we provide information to the board to help them make those kind of decisions. So as leadership staff, you're kind of operating in both worlds, short term, and this is what I have to do to make sure we're getting the day-to-day -day done, but you're also mindful of the future because you got to help the board get there. Another obstacle is governing board turnover. When you have a lot of board turnover, it makes it hard for change and improvements because you're constantly just trying to basically maintain what you have. And by the time you get someone built up and they're ready to really truly embrace what's being a board member, now you've got other board members leaving. Lack of clarity about governing board roles and responsibilities are, is another obstacle. And lastly, insufficient preparation and development of governing board leaders, such as the board president and committee chair. So just like you do a training for new staff people, you do a training for new board members, there should be development and training for people who become the leaders of those areas. Because there's a big difference between sitting in the boardroom and voting on something and running the meeting. And you want to make sure that those individuals are adequately, re adequately re prepared to fulfill that role. Now, all of these obstacles, just so you know, they came from Fullinger Foundation Capacity Guide in 2018. So I didn't make them up, but I am reporting to you this is what they said. And if you remember, Fullinger was they developed the top 10 that we did our exercise with. So how do we increase your miles per gallon? What are resources that are out there that you can use to strengthen capacity and outcomes? So I'm going to kind of go through a bullet point list of things that we have out there. The CSBG car monitoring is a resource to gauge your effectiveness. We've already talked about the Community Action Partnerships standards, standards of excellence, and we have also talked about the CCAP, the Certified Community Action Professional. There is also the ROMA implementer or, or trainer, having someone on staff for that as well. Uh, the Head Start self-assessment is another tool for strengthening capacity. Training and technical assistance. Now, this one can come from a variety of places. Every agency has TNTA money. The state offers TNTA money for certain things. And you should be training your governing board, your staff, and your volunteers. Another good tool is peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. A good one is Inca does the roundtables, and they do them for some specialty areas. I know they're doing it for human resources. They're doing it for fiscal. Those are great places for peers to talk, exchange ideas. If you have a, if you're having difficulty, reach out to a peer because they may have already went through it. So don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Needs assessments, and there's a lot of different types of needs assessments. Those are great capacity building tools. Your community action plan is designed in, the, in, in that regards as well. Because what are we trying to do? We're focusing on the outcomes. And lastly, 
implement the results oriented management and accountability roma everything can always kind of be tied back to roma so those are ways to increase your miles per gallon those are the resources that you have available so it's break time again it's another did you know section so this one comes from the national community action partnership or the partnership depending on how you want to uh, describe them. They say that I am 138. That's your organizational standards provides the foundation of monitoring, but those standards are the ground floor or the minimum requirement for management and operations. So that's what the partnership has to say about. I am 138 and Charles talked about that. He didn't use those exact words, but he, he talked about some other things that he had found on their website. So that kind of goes in concert. We're coming towards the end of the show. Here's the quote of the show. So every time we do a show, we're going to have a quote. This comes from Brian Orander uh, of Charitable Advisors. Uh, if you are unaware, he uh, you can look up Charitable Advisors. They send out a weekly uh, email, has a lot of good information in it. It's free of charge. But he says the capacity building is ongoing and never ending. So here's my parting thought from our guest speaker. So this was a convert from a conversation done prior to the presentation when I was talking to Charles, and this is what he had to say. And I, it was uh, pretty profound. And so I want to leave you with his thought. First, he says we are all community action. We are all in this together, and we are all in the same business. So that comes from Charles McCann. And what he's saying is, and, he, and you kind of heard his history. You know, he worked in community action. He did the state a, state association. He became a CCAP. He's worked with the national, you know, at the national level. He's kind of all over the place. But no matter where you're coming from, whether it's the community action agency, it's the state agency, it's the state association, we're all part of community action. We're all part of one team. We just have different roles that we play. But we're in the same business and our goal is the same thing, which is to make sure that we have a positive impact within our community and the low income population that is served. We just have different roles to achieve that. So the drive home, my closing thought. Embrace capacity building. It will serve you, your community and your customers well. And lastly, thank you for spending time with us. We hope you enjoyed today's test drive. So in case you want to get a hold of the car mechanic, I will put up my information. So you can reach me at sstjohn at icda.in.gov. And with that, Again, thank you so very much, and you guys have a wonderful day and make an impact in your community. Thank you. Take care.